Timothy Jones. I'm dean here at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. It's our great privilege to welcome you and to host a distinguished lecturer. And I'm grateful to Dr. James Katzinger, who is Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at USC, uh, for asking us to host this. Uh, Dr. Katzinger is the catalyst for this. And uh, it's a great pleasure we have uh, to host this. Now, uh, as the host, I have a couple of important tasks. One is some very uh, uh, mundane, but nevertheless important information. You need to use a restroom. You have this door. Turn to your right. The ladies' room comes first. And then that further down the hall is the men's room. If you need a drinking fountain, you go out that door. Also, turn right, and you'll see it. The wall. Also, my task this morning is to introduce the introducer of our distinguished lecturer, and I'm very happy to do that. The very Reverend Dr. Edward Lana is the recently retired Rector of Holy Transfiguration, Holy Transfiguration Orthodox Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he had served for some 17 years, from 2000 to 2017. Prior to that, he taught theology, missiology, in universities and seminaries in Germany, or it's a long list, Germany, Norway, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Chicago, finally here in Colombia. I've enjoyed talking with him just a minutes ago about the piety and spirituality of the Eastern Church. Very interesting person. He's the author of numerous articles and books on mission and theology, currently serving as an adjunct professor at Duke Divinity School. Dr. Ron, thank you. Good morning. Although I did meet Dr. Hart some years ago at Duke Divinity School, my first encounter with him came through the reading of his book, The Beauty of the Infinite, The Ascetics of Christian Truth. And that book left a lasting impression on his remarkable and practical insight, and in particular on his understanding of Christian truth. Today we live in a very divided world of competing truth claims. Some seek to establish the truthfulness of their own claims by attempting to reduce or eliminate the distance between their own positions and those with whom they disagree. And they do that by trying to force agreement, by pitting persuasion against persuasion. Uh, and so today we have presidents and priests peddling in lives attacking at common, trying to navigate these divided spaces with what Hart calls narratives of violence. But as he points out, Christian thought announces a God who is himself the distance of all things, the impossibility of exile, the peace of the infinite. Truth, then, is not a place at which one arrives after traversing the distance between our various opinions. No, it is rather the place where God's peace is to be shown. And so it is the crossing of the distances in peace and in love that Christian truth is made known. And in the degree to which it succeeds in remarrating that distance as love. So only by assuming the form of a ceaseless practice of peace, even in enduring the wounds all the ways borne by the body of Christ, can Christian rhetoric demonstrate and persuade that it is, in the end, the fire of an infinite love. This way of love and peace, it seems to me, gives us a practical way of dealing with the divisiveness of our day and arriving precisely at 
Dr. Hart has come a long way since writing that book. He is now a fellow at Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Studies. He continues to publish and lecture. So we are honored to have him with us. Please welcome Dr. David. Thank you. <laughs> that was very kind of you. I, um, I, I'm very grateful to have been invited here, and this is a much more pleasant venue for giving a lecture than most of the uh, auditoriums and lecture rooms that you find yourself placed in uh, <coughs> on visits like this. So I, I thank everyone involved. I mean, just the ceiling alone was worth coming uh, for. I, uh, I have two books coming out in the new f near future, I should, I, I should mention, but on each of which I've given a lecture, or about to give a lecture in this case, uh, both of which are controversial in uh, each in its own way, and uh, neither of which I can represent exhaustively in a single lecture. So I, I, I should warn you that I'm not uh, laying out here today an entire argument. The book from which these reflections are abstracted consists in six parts. Uh, the first being just uh, a consideration of the traditional logic of an eternal hell, a hell of perpetual torment and of successive conscious torment. The second being a, 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 a consideration of the lot, certain logical problems that this entails. But what then follows are four meditations on, in order, the metaphysics of creation from nothingness, the language of scripture and what it does and does not say, the nature of persons and what it is to be a person, and finally, the nature of free will as an act of rational agents. Uh, these uh, reflections are taken principally from the third meditation, which is the least dialectical, that is to say, has the fewest uh, logical arguments to make and the most purely affective and pathetic. I hope in that way it'll be persuasive. Um, let me start with a quotation from uh, Pascal's Pensée. It's uh, one I remember reading when I was very young uh, in French class in middle school. We had good schools in Maryland. Uh, I don't even know how to translate this word. Cet écoulement, this effluence, appears to us not only impossible, il nous semble même très injuste. It seems to us very unjust. For what could be more contrary to the rules of our miserable justice? Miserable justice qui était amenée éternellement un enfant incapable de volonté. What could be more contrary to the rules of our miserable justice than eternally to damn an, infinite inca a, a, an infant incapable of will for a sin wherein he appears to have had so small a part as it was committed 6,000 years before he was in existence? Six mille ans avant qu'il fût en être. Certainly nothing offends us more rudely than this doctrine, and yet without this mystery, the most incomprehensible of all, we're incomprehensible to ourselves. The knot of our condition uh, takes its twists and turns. Pensez replier ses tours dans cet abîme, in this abyss, in such a way that man is more inconceivable without this mystery than this mystery is inconceivable to man. Now, of course, uh, Pascal was uh, a Jansenist, uh, uh, that is a very severe Augustinian, and so he presumed uh, the damnation of unbaptized infants as a matter of course. Uh, not all of us would, certainly. Uh, I mean, Episcopalians and Orthodox, as a rule, don't hold to that. Uh, well, Episcopalians are slippery people, though. <laughs> I grew up among them, and they always dressed well. I was, uh, but hard to pin down. Uh, 
Generally speaking, there's something deeply attractive in Pascal's cosmic despair. It's a plangent melancholy, it's, it's occasional ghastly sublimity, it's dreamlike vagrancies amid a vast and suddenly unfamiliar universe of things and spaces. But whenever one catches a glimpse of the specific doctrinal commitments sustaining that despair, the picture ceases to be quite so enchanting and becomes instead something a little morbid. For me, this passage is an exquisite specimen of the way in which Christians down the centuries have excelled at converting the good tidings of God's love in Christ into something rather dreadful. Admittedly, it's difficult not to, to admire the sheer ingenuity with which, on behalf of dogmatic commitments they feel they can't abandon, many of them have striven to make the abominable seem, if not palatable, at least vaguely reasonable. They tell themselves, say, that an eternity of torment is an entirely condign penalty for even the smallest imaginable sin, the most trivial peccadillo, because the gravity of any transgression must be measured by the dignity of the one whom it has wronged, and God possesses infinite dignity. Or that the revelation of God's sovereign glory and dereliction and redemption is a good surpassing every other, and even makes the perpetual sufferings of rational beings something like a happy circumstance when viewed from the vantage of eternity. But to me, this is all nonsense. I mean, guilt's proportion is not an objective quantity, but an evaluation, and only a monstrous justice would refuse to assign guilt according to the capacities and knowledge of the transgressor. I mean, there has to be some proportion between mens rea and actus reus in legal terms. And a glory that's revealed by cruelty or vengeance is not a glory at all. So uh, let me suggest, uh, let, me, let me talk for a little bit about uh, someone <laughs> in church tradition remembered as the uh, father of fathers, the pillar of orthodoxy, uh, the great fourth century church father Gregory of Nyssa. Because it's often been my, uh, my uh, lament, my tireless refrain, my uh, cri de coeur, that he's not the voice that dominated in certain aspects of dogmatic development regarding sin and grace and especially eschatology, the destiny of souls. Uh, when Gregory looked at the eschatological language of the New Testament, what he believed he saw was not the story of some everlasting division between two cities of the redeemed and the reprobate, as did, the, say, the late Augustine in the last great work of genius he produced, but only a provisional division between two moments within the single economy of a universal salvation. And he thought this to be the case on scriptural grounds. For him, the making and redemption of the world belong to one great process by which God brings to pass the perfect creation that has resided from everlasting in the divine will and conceived and, 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 and intended by him before all ages. For him, in fact, God's act of creation is a twofold thing. There is an eternal creative act that abides in God as the end towards which all things are directed and for the sake of which all things have been brought about. And this he sees described in Genesis 1, the first creation account. Uh, well, Genesis 1 to Genesis 2, verse 3. And then there's a posterior creative act, the temporal exposition, which is both cosmic and historical, of this divine model, whose initial phases are then described in the second creation account of Genesis 2, verses 4 through 25. From eternity, argued Gregory, God has conceived of humanity under the form of the ideal human being, Anthropos. At once, humanity's archetype and perfection, a creature shaped entirely after the divine likeness, not male or female, possessed of all divine virtues, purity, love, impassibility, happiness, wisdom, freedom, immortality. But this does not mean, as we might expect when we look at these texts, simply that, that for Gregory, God first created an eternal platonic ideal of the human and then fashioned individual human beings in imitation of this universal ideal. What makes Gregory subversive is that for him, this primordial ideal human being comprises and indeed is identical with 
the entire pleroma, the entire plenitude, and he's taking this language from Paul, specifically uh, in Romans, of all human beings in every age from first to last. In his great treatise on the making of, of humankind, Gregory reads gen the first creation account, uh, uh, the account in which it is said that humanity is created in God's image. That term language isn't, of course, used in the second account as referring not to Adam, but to the conception within the eternal divine counsels of this full community of all humanity, the whole of the race, comprehended by God's foresight as in a single body, as he puts it. Which only in its totality truly reflects the divine likeness and the divine beauty. As for Adam and Eve, whose making is described in the second creation narrative. They were merely the first members, he believed, of that concrete community that only as a whole can truly reflect the glory of his creator. For now, it is only in the purity of the divine wisdom that this human totality subsists in its fullness, and it will emerge, he believed, into historical actuality in its entirety only at the end of a long temporal unfolding. This is the word he or succession, akaluthia, is the Greek word he uses, when it will be wholly recapitulated in Christ. Only then, in the ultimate solidarity of all humankind, will a being be made in the image and likeness of God, and God will have truly created humanity. It's this, as he puts it, the entire nature or race, the word physis can mean either, actually, that Gregory calls quote, the truly godlike thing, to theoikolin rima, the entire plenitude of the nature altogether, and God will bring this good creation he desires to pass in spite of sin, both within human history and against our apostasy from that story. At the same time, he argues in other places, like his great treatise on virginity, Sin has inaugurated its own aculothea of privation and violence, and so throughout the course of human history, God's original unfolding of creation must overcome the parasitic unfolding of evil. Even so, humanity, understood as the plenitude of God's election, never ceases to possess that deathless beauty that humanity, understood as an historical community, has largely lost. God, reflecting eternally upon that beauty, draws all things on towards the glory he intends for them, although according to a mystery, that is a grace that does not predetermine the operations of a human freedom that nevertheless cannot ultimately elude it. I'll be getting to my own point soon. I'm just... <laughs> According to that treatise on the making of humanity, and it's very interesting because Gregory, I mean, I, I, I can't give a sense of it here, but Gregory's reading of the entirety of scripture from Genesis through, well, for him, the book of Revelation wasn't part of the scriptural canon yet, but everything else, uh, with, I mean, it's an absolute tour de force of, of systematic reading in a way in which he unites the language of Paul to the language of Genesis and everything in between. And it's, and it's interesting that his treatise on the creation of humankind is also a great treatise on eschatology, on the ultimate state of all things. Because according to that treatise, the eternal human being who lives in God's counsels was from the first fashioned after the beauty of the divine Logos, and was made for no other end than to become the living body of Christ. The whole drama of incarnation, death, and resurrection was undertaken so that the eternal Son might reclaim those who are his own from everlasting. By himself entering into the plenitude of humanity as a man among men and women, and in thereby assuming our limits and our history as his own, Christ reoriented the race towards its true end. And because the human, to this is the important point, because the human totality is a living unity, the incarnation of the Logos, he believed, must be of effect for the whole. In his short commentary on the language of 1 Corinthians 15, he says that Christ 
assumed not just human nature in the a, a abstract, but he assumed the whole pleroma, the whole totality of human beings throughout all time, so that his glory has entered into all that is human. And it cannot be otherwise, he argued. Such is the indivisible solidarity of humankind that the entire body must ultimately be in unity with its head, whether that be the first or the last Adam. Hence Christ's obedience to the Father, even unto death, will be made complete, said Gregory, only eschatologically when the whole race gathered together in him, here again we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which for Gregory, as for many of the early church fathers, is sort of the entirety of Christian belief in Nuce. When the whole race gathered together in him will be yielded up as one body to the Father in the Son's gift of subjection, and God will be all in all. The Acolutheia of resurrection, he says, inaugurated at Easter in the one body of the race, is an unfolding now that cannot cease given the unity of human nature until the last residue of sin, shadow, and the last shadow of death has vanished. Uh, and Gregory says this is confirmed in John 20, 17, when Christ says, uh, goes to his God and Father and to the God and Father of his disciples, he presents all of humanity to God in himself. And uh, there's a wonderful, I won't, I don't, I'll run out of time if I try to summarize everything I have here, but there's a wonderful treatise he wrote called On the Soul and Resurrection, which is uh, a digest of the teachings of his brilliant sister Macrina on this eschatological reading, on this reading of biblical eschatology. Uh, for her, there will ultimately be a time when all divisions fall away and there will no longer be any separation between those, she says, who dwell within the temple precincts and those outside. But the point to understand about Gregory, the point that my jumping off point at least, is that for him, there can be no true human unity or any perfect unity between God and humanity, except in terms of the concrete solidarity of all persons in that complete community that is alone the true image of God. God shall be all in all, argues Gregory, in a, and it's in a treatise on infants who die before baptism, not simply by comprising humanity and himself in the abstract, but by joining each particular person, each unique inflection of the Pleroma's beauty to himself. This is not a union that can be simply imposed on, on humanity. Christ must affect the conversion of each soul within itself so that room is truly made for God in all, he says. Salvation by union with Christ must unfold within human freedom but for Gregory, in good classical Christian fashion, a good classical metaphysician that he was, evil and sin are always accidental conditions of human nature, not intrinsic qualities. Evil is a privation of an original goodness. It has no natural substance of its own. And so the sinfulness that separates rational creatures from God is only a disease corrupting and disabling the will, robbing it of its true rational freedom and it is a disorder that must ultimately be purged from human nature in its entirety, even if needs be by hell, which for Gregory, again, is not an eternal condition, but a necessary, uh, a necessary purging of sinful nature. But in the light of God's infinity, the proper end of evil will be shown to be nothing but its own disappearance. And then he says, God's glory will shine in each creature like the sun in an immaculate mirror, and each soul born into the freedom of God's image will turn of its own nature towards divine love. There is no other place, no other liberty. At the last, to the inevitable God, humanity is bound by its freedom. Alas, that's in the next chapter of my book, explaining that language. So uh, just take it from me. It makes sense. And, each person, he says, as God elects him or her from before the ages, is indispensable for the humanity God eternally wills could never come to fruition in the absence of any member of that body, any facet of that beauty. <clears throat> 
Apart from the one who has lost humanity as God wills, it could never be complete nor even exist as the creature fashioned after the divine image. The loss of even one would leave the body of the Logos incomplete and God's purpose in creation unaccomplished. So that's Gregory. Let me step back from this. In a sense, I think uh, we should already know that much of what Gregory presumes is true, if not for theological reasons, if not because we ha- um, think in, term, uh, in his terms regarding the language of creation and Genesis, just from a sober consideration of what it means to be a person. After all, it would be possible for us to be saved as individuals only if it were possible for us to be persons as individuals. But this creates any number of problems. I'm not sure that it's even really possible to distinguish a single soul in isolation as either saint or sinner in any absolute sense, inasmuch as we are all, as Paul says, bound in disobedience precisely by being bound to one another in the sheer contingency of our shared brokenness and the brokenness of our world and our responsibility one for another. Bound together in disobedience, says Paul, so that all may be shown mercy. Consequently, I can't even say where, at what extremity of pious despair, I could possibly draw a line of demarcation between tolerable and intolerable tales of eternal damnation. Now some stories, of course, we're able to reject out of hand. Let me me be the sort of uh, bitter-souled, inflexible Calvinist of the 17th century Scottish Highlands. A child is born one day in poverty, suffers from some horrible and quite incurable congenital disease, dies in agony, unbaptized, and then on some accounts consecrated by theological tradition, descends to perpetual torment as the just penalty for a guilt inherited from a distant ancestor or as an epitome of divine sovereignty and ele- election and dereliction. Now most of us will recognize that this is more a degenerate parody of the gospel than anything taught by Christ or the apostles so repugnant to conscience that even if it were possible to, even if it were true, per impossibile, it would still be morally indefensible to believe it. But then at what juncture does the language of eternal damnation really cease to be scandalous? Let's presume that the child who dies without reaching the baptismal font does not in fact descend into hell and is not even conveniently wafted away into the perfumed limbo of unbaptized babes, as in Thomistic theology, but instead at once ascends to eternal bliss, there to grow forever into a deeper communion with God, as Gregory of Nyssa says in his treatise on on children who die unbaptized. This is a much cheerier picture. But let's not stop there. Let's also imagine another child born that very same day, maybe that same hour, in perfect health, but who grows into a man of monstrous character, cruel, selfish, ultimately murderous, and who eventually dies unrepentant, thereupon to descend to an endless hell. Well, no doubt this fellow chose to become what he became to the extent that he was able to do so, so maybe he's only received what he justly deserves. And yet even then I can't forget or consider it irrelevant that he was born into a ruined world where a child can be born in poverty, suffer from some horrible and incurable congenital disease, die in agony. So what precisely did that wicked man really know of the good and how clearly and with what rational power over his own will? Certainly he did not know everything, at least not with perfect clarity nor did he enjoy complete rational discretion over his own deeds and desires. This thought alone is enough to convince me of the problems in the traditional doctrine, but it's it's not my principal point. I want to say something more radical, which is that there is no way in which persons can be saved as persons except in and with all other persons. 
I regard it uh, as no more, I regard this as no more uh, than an acknowledgement of certain obvious truths about the fragility, dependency, and exigency of what makes us who we are. Now, I, I hope none of us is able to agree with the argument of Thomas Aquinas, among others, who was here repeating something said by Peter Lombard much earlier, that the knowledge of the torments of the damned will increase the felicity of the blessed in heaven. Thomas teaches us. Uh, in, uh, and every time I say somebody objects that I'm making that up, but no, it's the Summa Theologiae supplement to the third part, Quaestio 94. Uh, and he simply repeats, and, and there's a reason why he's saying this. Now, as Thomas's apologists will helpfully observe, he means only that the saints will derive pleasure from the contrast between their beatitude and the damnation they were spared, not that the blessed will take intrinsic sadistic delight in the spectacle as such. Uh, of course, that's a nonsensical distinction because the ability to find pleasure in seeing someone else suffering the pains to which one oneself immune is precisely what sadism is. But why debate the point? Most of us today are not going to defend the argument. Our tender consciences require more emollient formulations. But many of today's gentler, gentler uh, champions of the idea of eternal torment, in their efforts to make emotional sense of a paradise of the blessed in which the bliss of the saints is undiminished by the misery of those left behind end up making proposals scarcely less chilling. I recently read an evangelical apologist for the, well, let's call them the infernalist orthodoxies, argue that it's morally correct that to, for the saved to feel p no pity for the damned. Now, okay, you know, the, the sort of mundane psychologism here is a bit peculiar, but he said, but his argument was it's perfectly forgivable, for instance, if you're on the roads to avert your eyes from a frightful accident because you can't rescue the victims and not to think of them again. Now, needless to say, this is a council of moral imbecility. I mean, neither can my pity for a little girl dying of cancer cure her for what that is worth, but what an atrocity of a man I would have to be to cease pitying her for that reason. Uh, but, but perhaps, though, I'm illicitly tipping the scales by choosing that example, little girl. Maybe there are more pardonable forms of indifference to the sufferings of others. At least one Catholic philosopher of my acquaintance has recently argued that there's no scandal in thinking the saints in heaven won't be bothered in the least. And being a Thomist, he, he accepts Thomas's definition about the torments of the damned below. After all, he argued, few of us ever spare a thought for, say, the serial murder, murderer incarcerated for life. I'm not entirely sure how to answer that argument uh, since the closing verses of Matthew's 25th chapter seem to suggest that Christians are held to a higher standard of ethical concern. Um, but more to the point, it's impossible, logically speaking, to be indifferent to another person's fate in perfect isolation. True, most of us don't spare a thought for the murderer in prison, though frankly, there's nothing particularly commendable in that dreary emotional fact, nor is it a good guide to how we would expect to see things from the perspective of eternity. But that murderer's brother, mother, father, sister, child, wife, or friend must think about him and must grieve over his fate. Hence, our indifference to him must also logically be an indifference to their sufferings as well. And it requires little imagination to see how this small, prudent, seemingly rational degree of callousness might be magnified if carried into the calculus of eternity into an absolute moral detachment from all other persons. After all, taken to its extreme logical entailments, our willingness to surrender even the most depraved of souls to a final unrelieved torment is tacitly a willingness also to ignore the sufferings of potentially everyone. Just checking the time on my phone. We cannot choose to cease to care for any soul without thereby choosing to cease to care for 
for every soul to which that particular soul is attached by bonds of love or loyalty, and for every other soul attached to each of these, and if need be, for every soul that has ever been, if that's what it takes to be perfectly blissfully indifferent to the damned. And so it seems, if we allow the possibility that even so much as a single soul might slip away unmourned into everlasting misery, the ethos of heaven turns out to be every soul for itself, which is also, curiously enough, precisely the ethos of hell. So I know of another evangelical writer, however, who proposes that God, to grant the saints the perfect blessedness of the kingdom, will veil the sufferings of the damned from their eyes, and even elide all memory of lost friends and family from their recollections. This is better, say, than Martin Luther saying that we'll actually rejoice to see our mothers and fathers and children roasting in hell. Luther could be a bit blunt. <laughs> I suppose that this is better also than the Thomistic picture, but it's, a, it's distinctly tragic nonetheless. I mean, it's how terrible just to imagine at a homely, a terrestrial level that the beatitude of the saints must consist to some degree in the destruction of part of their humanity. And surely a blessedness that depends upon ignorance is a peculiarly defective one. But perhaps these really are the only alternatives. If there really is an eternal hell of torment, the blessedness of the saved absolutely must consist either in callousness or in blissful stupidity. Now, granted, part of the absurdity of all these arguments is the mundane psychologization of heaven and hell they involve, as I said earlier, and the somewhat burlesque effects this produces. Whatever the world to come may be, it surely will not involve the souls of the saved gathering like eager tourists along steel railings above the Grand Canyon, gazing down into hell and waving impishly to their aunts and cousins amid the flames. Though there are one or two cousins of mine. That... <laughs> but there's a far larger and grimmer absurdity in the moral possibilities these arguments ask us to entertain. We can't even faintly imagine the final state of a redeemed soul, all right. But surely Christians must take seriously the eschatological imagery of scripture, and their talk of salvation involves a corporate beatitude, a kingdom of love and knowledge, a wedding feast, a city of the redeemed, the body of Christ. Hence, the hope Christians cherish must in some way involve the preservation of whatever is deepest in and most essential to personality rather than an escape from personality. But finite persons are not self-enclosed individual substances. They are dynamic events of relationship. And this poses a problem. For me, all attempts to imagine the condition of God's kingdom, if it truly excludes a certain number of souls condemned to eternal torment, irresistibly summons up a single image. And it's that of a parent, usually a mother, because that's how our imaginations work, a parent who keeps and cherishes countless tender memories of the child who, quite contrary to his or her will or best efforts, grew to be an evil person. And in cherishing those memories of the innocent and delightful being that was and that has now been lost in the labyrinth of his or her own damaged soul, cannot relent in hope. Now, if all of that, those memories, those anxieties and delights, those feelings of desperate love, are they really to be consigned to the fire as just so much chaff? Must it all be forgotten or willfully ignored for heaven to enter into that parent's soul? And if so, is this not the darkest tragedy ever composed, and is God not then a tragedian utterly merciless in his poetic omnipotence? And who then exactly is, and this is the question, who is that parent when he or she has achieved union with God once those memories have been either converted into indifference or altogether expunged? Who or what is that being whose identity is no longer determined by its relation to that child? I can't help but feel that this is something like the paradox of the ship of Theseus, for those of you who may know it except that in this case, in which the deepest emotional and personal elements that compose a soul have been stripped away, it's the living form rather than its material instantiation that's been obliterated. 
Why would we even speak about salvation at that point rather than about the total replacement of one being by another? What remains to be saved? A spark, a spiritual essence detached from all identity? Is the bliss of the beatific union with God so transfiguring and consuming and complete as to reduce all subsidiary relations to nothing and thereby in a single stroke to reduce each personhood <coughs> to nothing? so that all that remains is an anonymous act of intellection immersed in perpetual, unpitying delight. This is an obvious thing, really. This blessedly oblivious account of the afterlife of the elect is incoherent simply because for salvation to be the salvation of persons, as opposed to the final liberation of something anonymous that must be rescued from its defiling entanglement with other human beings, there must be some sort of continuity of identity between the soul as it exists during its wanderings in this world and the soul as it shall be when raised up into God. And such continuity is impossible apart from those we love because we are, as persons, the creatures of our loves. The issue here is not simply that our identities are constituted by our memories, though of course they are, we're not God. But also that the personhood of any of us in its entirety is created by and sustained within the loves and associations and affinities that shape us. There is no such thing as a person in separation. Personhood as such is not a condition possible for an isolated substance. It is an act, not a thing. It's achieved only in and through a history of relations to others. We are finite beings in the state of becoming, and in us there is nothing that is not action, dynamism, an emergence into a fuller or a retreat into a more impoverished existence. And so we are those others who make us. Spiritual personality is not mere individuality, nor is personal love one of its merely accidental conditions or extrinsic circumstances. We exist as the place of the other, to borrow a phrase from the great thinker Michel de Certeau. Surely this is the profoundest truth in the doctrine of resurrection. It's a claim not simply about resumed corporeality, whatever that might turn out to be. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 makes it a very mysterious thing in that regard. But more crucially, about the fully restored existence of the person as socially, communally, corporately constituted. For Paul, flesh and blood, the mortal life of the psychical body, as he calls it, the body of the soul, passes away, but not embodiment as such, not the spiritual body, which is surely not merely a local, but also a communal condition. Each person is a body within the body of humanity, which in its proper nature is the body of Christ. Where in this world then, or in the world to come, does the web of those associations that make us who we are, where does it reach an end? And our personhood, to go further, must surely consist not only in the immediate love of those close at hand, but also in our disposition towards those whom we, by analogy, care for from afar, or even in the abstract. For the most essential law of charity, when it is truly active, is that it must inexorably grow beyond all immediately discernible boundaries in order to be fulfilled. And all of those in whom each of us is implicated and who are implicated in us are themselves in turn implicated in countless others on and on without limit. We belong to an indissoluble coherence of souls. A person cannot be a person at all except in and by way of all other persons. Gregory of Nyssa certainly understood this. Human beings are not in the metaf metaphysical sense substantial relations or pure acts as, as Trinitarian theology borrowing from Christological language uh, would come to, to say perichoresis, that is reciprocally containing one another as the persons of the Trinity are said to be. We are not metaphysically simple in that way. But if we are not subsistent relations or if we are not metaphysically simple, we are nonetheless, so long as we are anything at all, subsistences of relationality. 
Each of us is an entire history of attachments, of affinities, of loves. And none of those is merely accidental to some more essential self. Yes, the psychological self within us, don't get me wrong, that small, miserable, empirical ego that likes to strut and fret its hour upon the stage of the world, is a diminished, contracted, limited expression of spirit and must ultimately be reduced to nothing if we are to be free from what separates us from God and neighbor. But the unique personality upon which that ego is parasitic is not itself merely a chrysalis to be shed. So then, either, if this logic is correct, either all persons must be saved or none can be saved. As that very famous theologian Abraham Lincoln said, when asked who would be in heaven, he said, it's either everyone or no one. He was a universalist, by the way, to the degree he had firm theological convictions. A lot of people in the 19th century were. It was all the rage. According to the traditional picture of a dual eternity, a final division of the saved and the damned, whether the latter be tortured forever or merely forever annihilated, God could in fact save no persons at all. He could of course erase the elect as whatever they once were, shattering their memories and attachments like the gates of hell, and then raise up some other being in each of their places, thus converting the will of each into an idiot bliss stripped of the loves that made him her or her this person. But persons, it seems, could not be saved. They could only be damned. Only in hell could any of us possess something like a personal destiny, tormented perhaps by the memories of the loves we squandered or betrayed, but not deprived of them altogether. Is this then our choice after all, either a hell of eternal torment or a heaven that is the annihilation of everything that ever made us who we were? If that is so, if to enter heaven we must be reduced to anonymous essences, each indiscernibly distinct from every other, perhaps it is to hell that we should want to go. I began with a quotation from Pascal, so let me draw to a close with a long quotation from St. George MacDonald. Sorry, I just canonized him right now. I, I, I think I'm allowed to do that. I won't try the uh, Scots accent, though. Who that loves his brother would, be, would not, upheld by the love of Christ and with a dim hope that in the far-off time there might be some help for him, arise from the company of the blessed and walk down into the dismal regions of despair to sit with the last, the only unredeemed, the Judas of his race, and be himself more blessed in the pains of hell than in the glories of heaven, who in the midst of the golden harps and the white wings, knowing that one of his kind, one miserable brother in the old world time when men were taught to love their neighbors themselves was howling unheeded far below in the vaults of the creation, who I say would not feel that he must arise, that he had no choice, that awful as it was, he must gird his loins and go down into the smoke and the darkness and the fire, traveling the weary and fearful road into the far country to find his brother, who I mean that had the mind of Christ, that had the love of the Father." Unquote. I actually think that MacDonald's words indicate the only true sense in which the sufferings of the damned could contribute to the beatitude of the saved by awakening again and yet again a truly substitutionary love within souls whose whole being and delight consists precisely in such love. And really, if there is any true continuity between the charity we're called to cultivate in this life and the transfiguring love that supposedly unites us to God, then surely there can be no break upon our desire to include those outside the company of the, de the redeemed. Such love could find its complete joy only in the joy of completion and would not even be able to distinguish between this corporate desire for the salvation of all and the individual soul's longing for its own salvation. I am not I in myself alone, but only in all others. If then anyone is in hell, I too, partly, am in hell. Happily, however, if the Christian story is true, and especially in the way that Gregory of Nyssa reads it, uh, 
That love cannot now end in failure or tragedy. Gregory's not alone, by the way. There's a whole list of patristic figures I could add. Uh, he's just the most systematic. The descent into those depths where we seek out and find those who are lost and find our own salvation in so doing would not be a lonely act of spiritual heroism or a futile rebellion of finite wills against a merciless eternity. We're after all supposed to be saved from death and sin, not from God. The whole substance of Christian faith is the conviction that another has already indecisively gone down into that abyss for us to set all the prisoners free, even from the chains of their own hatred and despair. And hence, the love that has made all of us who we are and that will continue throughout eternity to do so cannot ultimately be rejected by anyone. Thus all shall have their share in, as Gregory says in his great mystical commentary on the Song of Songs. The redeemed, quote, the redeemed unity of all united one with another by their convergence upon the one good. Only thus will humanity, according to the divine image, come into being, and only thus will God be truly all in all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sit down, but I'm still going to take questions if anyone wants to ask them, yeah. So Dr. Hart, we don't have to change questions. Um, I'm told that anyone interested perhaps should come up, use this microphone to be heard, and uh, have an exchange then with uh, Dr. Hart. So any questions from the audience? Or you are, you're all entirely persuaded now. There's nothing Nothing further to settle, no questions to ask. Hmm. I see some people coming just now. Well, it would allow me to share. And I've been asked to have, make sure your mouth is right up to this microphone to be heard properly. Hello, I have uh, two, two sort of questions slash possible contentions with your, with your whole. Yeah, anyway, so. Uh, Lots of words for it. Um, the first question would be, if, if eternity is outside of time, is there consecutiveness in eternity? And if there's not, then would not sort of the same meaning of both John of Climax's ladder and the traditional toll booth, I, uh, then be that the state in which you die it's sort of that state in which you end up in eternity. Mm, yeah. Um, uh, no, no, stop there, stop there. Uh, no. Uh, first of all, uh, that eternity is outside time is a truth that can only be the case of an infinite and simple being, God. You know, cannot be true of human beings. Human beings are finite acts of conscious intentionality, therefore they must move towards the future. Gregory of Nyssa also laid this out with incredible brilliance, and that's why his understanding of the union of a finite soul with God is a pectasis, a, a, a success of outstretching. Now, it's not a successive in the terms of chronos, that is, the time of generation and decay, but it's definitely, it must be for a finite soul, one that possesses futurity, or it would simply be the, the soul would simply cease to exist. And they're, they're, the, the philosophical reasons for that and the reasons that Gregory adduces and the scriptural reasons for believing that are all quite, um, quite uh, unanswerable. Please don't bring up the toll houses stuff. I'm, I'm not interested in Orphic Gnostic nonsense. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then second, since you're Eastern Orthodox, how do you reconcile your view of universalism with the Fifth Ecumenical Council's decry of Africa states? Yeah, it, it, that never happened. The Fifth Ecumenical Council did not condemn universalism. It didn't even condemn origin. Uh, there was something called originism that was separately condemned that got added in to the minutes of the councils, but no good scholar believes that the council ever even addressed it. And what was condemned then was not universalism as such, but a particular narrative that was based on a metaphysics, mostly based on the thought of Bar Sudeli. Uh, so that's an historical error. There's never been a con. Every good Orthodox scholar of the 20th century, 
uh, not just people like Alfeyev, but you know, Evdokimov, but even George Florovsky has said there has never been a condemnation of universalism doctrinally by the Orthodox Church. Thank you for your talk. Um, I wonder what can you say to uh, those theologians who insist that we can only hope that all can be saved and we can't actually teach us or Yeah, I mean that's the standard view. That's the like Hans Horst von Balthasar. I have no use for that. And I'll tell you why. Why would we hope for it? Because we think that's the best thing that could happen. Are we saying that God's not going to do the, you know, God's not going to be able to achieve the best thing that's going to happen? So the whole drama of creation is just a provision, it's just a relative good. He only got as much out of it as he could. I mean, it's, 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 I think the whole idea of hopeful universalism is simply hedging your bets that you might turn out to be more merciful than God and, and that you'll have that satisfaction in eternity. Uh, so no, I, I've never had any, I've had, never had any time, I hate that little book by Hans Urs von Balthasar, not because it's not well meant, but because at the end of the day, what he says is, oh, there are all these scriptural verses that seem to promise universal salvation, but there are others that are full of dire warnings that have traditionally been taken to mean eternal damnation, though, as he also points out, linguistically, that's not necessarily the case. And all we should do is hold them in tension and pious hope so that we you know, we, we have the charitable impulse to hope for all, but, but enough uh, fear and trembling to know that God might turn out to be a Calvinist. <laughs> to me, it's just silly. I mean, either you believe that, that love never fails and that the will of God really is, intention is that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, the scripture says, or you believe that's a lie that's just put there because God, you know, is infinitely resourceful. He can even make, as has been, as even Thomas Aquinas argues with brilliance, uh, make one freely will the good without trespassing on your freedom. So, yes, I don't care for that. <laughs> the hopeful universalist position. You know. It's very astute of you to observe that, yeah. Um, I mean, I know uh, quite a lot of very uh, traditionalist Catholics who hate the current Pope, um, largely because of his perverse desire to be a Christian. Um, <laughs> as far as I can tell, I mean, it's all that love and mercy and take care of creation and, and welcome, welcome the refugee and all that. Stuff that you know, Jesus and other hippies, you know, talk about. Um, but uh, the the death penalty issue is interesting because one of the thing about, one of the things that's interesting about Catholic traditionalism is that uh, if you've ever been in these circles, what's called traditionalism is that it's a fixation and a love, a fixation on and a love of 16th century Catholicism. And therefore, it regards the resourceful movement that went back to the patristic church to try to reconstruct doctrine and understanding of grace on those terms as somehow modernist. So that the 16th century is more ancient and authoritative than the fourth. And one of the things Francis has done, I don't know ultimately how Francis will turn out. We'll see what emerges in the question of uh, the abuse crisis, what he has done or what he hasn't done. He can't speak now without condemning his predecessor, so he can't speak. So we'll, I don't know ultimately how Francis will turn out. But what's clearly the case is many of his moves have been an attempt to return to an earlier 
understanding of the, of the gospel is proclaimed. And one thing that's just a historical fact is that the early Christians thought Christians could never participate in capital punishment. I mean, this is just, we, the patristic evidence on that is absolutely overwhelming. But I think that behind that, you're right, there is, there is a different argument going on. Because the Catholic traditionalists who are violently opposed to his new pronouncement, the way he his, he's made pronouncements on capital punishment, see it often as being of a piece with a kind of, of latitudinarian tolerance of such things. I mean, these people who really, I, I've known I mean, I personally, I, here, I'm going to slander people I know. I won't name them, except, of course, well, no, I won't name them. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, for some of them, hell is the best part of the story. Because they, they belong to an exclusive club, and they intend to enjoy that exclusiveness throughout eternity. They want to be in the gated community and in the best private schools, and they want to have someone out there to envy them. There, I mean, there is that kind of, and for them, the softness of Francis on the issue of capital punishment is of a piece uh, with this. And I have heard them make explicit links between his teaching on capital punishment and what they, th they suspect is his secret universalism. Sorry, I took so long to answer that, but it's all right. the most popular defense of the idea of an eternal hell. It's also the most logically incoherent, as much as it seems. No, I mean, it seems like it works. And actually, believe it or not, Gregory of Nyssa also answered that. Gregory basically, you know, really theology should have stopped then. <laughs> I mean, Gregory died around 395. At that point, everything should have just been commentary. But, you know, no, there were some great theologians after him, all the ones who learned from him. Um, it, 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 I mean, gosh, it would take hours to go th through this. Well, they all, I mean, Gregory and all the rest in this tradition agree that hell is locked from the inside, that it's, that it's the willful refusal of God's love which is hell. Uh, the notion that, that one can be solidified in a state of perpetual rejection of God, however, f falls into any number of, of problems. One. Is that sort of rational freedom actually possible? And I would say, and this is the fourth meditation of my book, logically speaking, it's impossible because of the very nature of what rational freedom is and what, and what the criteria are for any free act, uh, including, of course, rational knowledge and intentionality and the degree to which that could be an object of absolute culpability or whether, and indeed, can you speak of fashioning a character that subsists entirely on the privation of love, and Gregory has very good arguments why you can't. More to the point, though, you notice that even if that were true, even if that were possible, and I argue that in my book, it argues that the free will defense of hell is the most catastrophically incoherent of all at the philosophical level, it wouldn't change the rest of the argument. God would fail. I mean, it, no one could be saved. Great, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce, which is one of the few books of Lewis's that I actually very much like. I'm not a big C.S. Lewis fan, I have to confess. I say that among American Christians, and they recoil in shock. 
Uh, he's more loved in this country than anywhere else. I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of Lewis I like, I mean, but The Great Divorce is his masterpiece. But he makes this argument, you know, will the whole universe be held hostage by this one defiant, you know, petty Prometheus? Yes. Actually, the whole universe is held hostage by that person if, if, uh, uh, if love is what love has to be, if personality is what personality has to be, and if what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 will come to pass. But again, we needn't bother because the argument itself turns out to be logically. It's, it's based on a voluntarist, libertarian understanding of freedom anyway that when rationally examined turns out to be self-contradictory. Ultimately, you end up with a model of freedom that's no different from a random natural event like a volcano. It's, it, it, rational freedom has to be purposive, and once that's true, what's it oriented towards? It would have to be what one knows to be true and good, and from that unfolds any number of reasons why the free will defense of hell is self-subverting. But you'll have to read the book. Uh, I, I advocate usually buying about 12 copies. Uh, because you'll want to make copious notes, and then you'll want to share it with friends, and then you'll want to get them to buy extra copies. All right. Will it be an honest question? <laughs> Will it be? So, uh, <laughs> it be kind? Okay. in my freedom, how do I keep from becoming complacent? Of course I'll be saved. Eventually I'll be saved. And then how, what motivates me in my own freedom, the synergy of the synergy of relation to God? He's not going to impose salvation upon me, but only working with my own freedom will he save me. How do I make choices in the direction of that if I say to myself, what the heck, it's all going to work out anyway? Well, you realize that everyone in this tradition firmly believed in the reality of hell. Uh, there's, there's a line from uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia. Would you rather that your hand be cured by a balm or by an amputation, you know. But re uh, on the whole, they didn't, uh, uh, oh, that's not Theodore, that's someone else in the Syrian tradition, I'm trying to remember who it was. Anyway, um, you know, in, in, it's funny how little that question occurs because it, it's assumed that, uh, that there's a kind of spontaneous love for the good and the love for God which is its own rationality, its own logic of choosing the good and choosing God. So the more that we're freed from delusion and sin, the more naturally we adhere to God. That we're not simply fleeing hell, but that we're rushing forever into the embrace of one we love. Uh, but that said, there was, you know, you know the history of uh, the early church well enough to know this, even uh, among uh, in the great church tradition, in places like Alexandria and elsewhere, it was assumed that there were levels of understanding. There was this distinction between the pneumatiki, the most spiritual persons, the people who were merely psychiki, you know, and some people who were very low in love. And so they, they, sadly, they were, you know, they were not, they were not spiritual egalitarians in this regard, at least not in this life. They believed that you had to terrify indomitably uh, perverse and obstinate natures with the language of, of eternal hell or the fear of hell constantly, while to the more enlightened you could speak of these things uh, in, a, in, a, in a purer sense. So there's, a, of course, a sermon of Gregory of Nazianzus in which he suddenly shifts into a more Katharevus of Greek, you know, a more purist of Greek, so that the very educated in the room, he's talking about hellfire, you know, it's, it's, a, good, it's a great uh, fire and damnation sermon, but it's not quite Jonathan Edwards, but again, you know, this is pre-Calvinist hellfire. Um, he suddenly pauses and says in this more 
in this more elevated tone. But of course, some of us, or some here, prefer to think of this in a more uh, elevated way, in a way keep, in more in keeping with the divine mercy and love. You know, then he shifts back. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a sort of, I'm, I'm sorry to say, a sort of cynical sense that one had to terrify uh, certain persons into, uh, because otherwise they would hear I'll be safe one day. Origen supposedly didn't like to talk about, uh, uh, about the issue openly because for him, the terror of the refining fire of hell I mean, you know, they really had, it's almost like Buddhist tales. I mean, they, they come to an end, but they had extravagant notions of just how bad it is to have to be saved by fire rather than by love. But they're all drawing on Paul, right? It's, it's chapter three. Uh, that man's works. I mean, there are only two categories of persons there in that chapter that Paul talks about. Those whose works will stand the test of the fire of God's judgment. And those whose works will be consumed, but then they will be saved as through fire. There's no third category mentioned. It's just assumed that he means among the elect, even though that language is very suspect when you try to find how Paul really uses it. That's how they thought about it, and they, you know, if, if one needs fear, there is something to fear in immense pain and despair and alienation and loss. But I think the reason why that question didn't seem important to someone like Gregory or to, say, Isaac and Nineveh is they just assumed that the process of salvation itself is, is a clarification of the mind and will in such a way that one moves towards God as the natural end of a created rational nature. So the more one is, is set free from sin and death, the more naturally one becomes like God. Okay. Is it you again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This might be too big of a question, but um, I noticed that you don't seem to be too big of a fan of libertarian freedom. Um, while, you know, I think maybe compatibilistic free will may be unsatisfactory in your eyes as well. Um, no, is there a third no. Yeah, I mean, libertarian free will, again, the way it's, it's uh, uh, philosophically defined by those who defend it is incoherent. I mean, you know, because the most radical version of it suggests that the will is capable of spontaneously positing an end for itself and pursuing that end. If you can give me a coherent phenomenology of any act you've ever undertaken in your entire life that doesn't have at least a more transcendental, fixed, purposive end, uh, then I will have to kill you because you'll have come up with an argument. No, uh, 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 it's simply not. I mean, the, the, the classical, I mean, the, the modern notion of libertarian freedom, I think, is just absurd, and there's never been a good argument made for it. But, uh, you know, the, the intellectualist tradition, I think, always wins that argument. Uh, that's where I'm in full agreement with the Thomists, for instance. Thomas was a clever guy. He ate too much. But, you know, um, but uh, as for, you know, you don't need a third way. I mean, compatibilism, again, depends on like a hundred different schools of this. Most of those already start from a libertarian presupposition and then try to show how a non-libertarian determinism is compatible with, with a libertarian freedom, you know, or some sort of, and that's, again, you're starting with the wrong presuppositions. Uh, so. I would say the classical <coughs> understanding of freedom, the intellectualist understanding, the one that was always presumed from the earliest, from, from antiquity up to early modernity, being more logically cogent, is the one that, that's worth adopting. Yeah, what would I, what should I read to learn more about the intellectualist version of this? Because from my perspective, 
I know. It's like, it's like, it's like choosing, as last night, we're asked to choose between Cartesian dualism or mechanistic materialism, right? Or, or materialist monism. And, those, and those, this is a false choice because the two modern options that, that have excluded any number of other more rational possibilities. Uh, well, there are any number of great expositions of it. Um, oh, Iris Murdoch, The Sovereignty of the Good, I think. That, uh, I think that's what it's called. The uh, Fire in the Sun. Uh, she's good on this. Um, uh, uh, what, what's that uh, wonderful American? Uh, w. Norris Clark. But anyway. Uh, okay. This may be a question for the next chapter or even the next book. Uh, in wrestling with apocalyptic literature in this season, with how to, how to preach it, an advisor of mine, who was a retired seminary professor, said, we don't reduce it to just the Jesus and me uh, relationship. Right. And you have, you have emphasized that uh, in myriad ways, especially saying none of us are in relation with God unless we all are. I was wondering if you could open yet a further door to um, the cosmic renewal right. of creation. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's uh, also in the book uh, to a lesser degree because it, the, the book it focuses on a specific question. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, this is an old argument I do have with the Thomists and have had theatrically in public that, uh, of course, all the scriptural language, not just the apocalyptic language, the language of the prophets and this, of salvation is of, uh, that term apokatastasis means restoration, apokatastasis panto, restoration of all things. And all the eschatological imagery of, uh, of salvation is cosmic in scope. It's, you know, it's not, it's not spirits prescinded from the flesh ascending to a, to a disembodied heaven. It's the renewal of creation and, uh, uh, all the animals and plants rejoicing along with, with humanity. The greatest figure in patristic tradition, I don't know why, not that you have to stick there, but the great, and this is Maximus the Confessor, in that he understood, uh, he, this is wonderful. See, I have a thing, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those who thinks Maximus was secretly a universalist as well, because I don't see how the logic of the system works, but putting that aside, for him, the, re the, the recreation of the human is the recreation of the human as the relationship of the whole cosmos to the spiritual order, which has become, it's a relationship that's become broken and distorted by human sin and cruelty and, and ignorance, and that, um, that that too is part of the story of salvation. There are these things called the the alienations or the estrangements that are overcome in Christ, and one of them is the estrangement between humanity and creation, and creation and the terrestrial paradise. So. Um, usually when I hear talks about apostasy, universalism, the question of salvation of demons or redemption of demons comes up. And I'm, I'm particularly curious from your perspective because, like, while we are supposed to have a relationship with other humans, with the creative world, like the last question, presumably we're not supposed to with demons. So, from. Uh, well, again, uh, uh, those cousins of mine I mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> I, I, I have my suspicions. Well, Gregory uh, actually went farther than Origen in this because in his uh, catechetical oration, he just basically states, well, of course, the devil is saved too. And all, you know. It would have to be the case uh, for him, if, you, if one believes in this spiritual principalities, that for God to be all in all, God must be the full rational content of all free spiritual wills. He must be the object of love and devotion and knowledge in all rational wills, including those of angels and devils. And he, uh, now remember, don't, I don't want to go into the obscurities of first century angelology and demonology, which doesn't really resemble what most of us now have in mind. Uh, it's, it's not, but that whole, Remember 1 Corinthians 15, that's for them, for, for, 
Gregory as it was for Origen, as it was for Theodore of Mopsuestia and Diodore of Tarsus and so many others. It was the, the chapter that sums up the whole Christian history. It is about the reconciliation, subordination, but for them, subordination, I mean, literally means put in order in a proper relation of all things in heaven, on earth, below the earth. I mean, they, they understood it as a complete reconstitution of the, whole, of the whole community of spiritual beings. that it's a bad idea. Uh, I mean, I, I, why, why, what's the question? Well, if you're contemplating suicide, you're basically saying it's better over there than it is over here. Well, uh, I mean, again, as I say, if all of those uh, war dire warnings about descending willfully into hell are true, then I would think suicide is generally, I don't know, because every, see, <laughs> The way we think about suicide has always been rather perverse anyway. I mean, I hate to say it, but Orthodox tradition is horrible on this for many, for a long time. Uh, even not allowing prayers for those who commit suicide, um, which is a curious thing. Um, but it's assumed, it's always been assumed, that the suicide is harming those around him or her doing more harm to them than he or she grasps, is doing terrific damage to his or relation to God, and therefore entering more deeply into a hellish condition. Again, none of these universalists that I've mentioned today in this book did not believe in hell. They all believed in hell, they believe, and I'm pretty sure they assumed that suicide is a, is a specific, a very privileged entry into hell. I don't think that, because I, I think that, uh, but I do think one's in a condition, in a hellish condition when one commits suicide, not necessarily a culpable condition, but a condition of being lost and suffering, and, and suicide is not the answer, prayer, healing uh, is. I mean, if the only, if the only, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the, what the question is, because uh, well, I, I think the, the position that comes to mind is that I'm feeling particularly alone, uh -huh. so I'm not feeling that connectedness, which I uh -huh. think if you felt the connectedness, you might not feel that despair. Right. So if I feel that aloneness, and I look over the, the boundary, and I say, well, gosh, I'm, uh, heaven has got to be better than this. I'm out of here. Right. Well, uh, needless to say, as I said, traditionally, it's always been assumed that suicide does not lead to heaven. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. But not immediately. So I think if there are no more questions, and I think probably Dr. Herb is getting a little weary here, his voice is tiring, I can tell. We should bring this to a close, but I do want to thank him. Perhaps for two rest readily assuming that we're all in the Monte Key in his room and divulging these secrets too readily without warning. See, I'm, I'm a total anarchist in this regard. I don't tear down the, uh, the clerical establishment's privileged sense. Uh, but thank you so much, so. Dr. Hart, and thank you all for coming.